If you want to learn more about our church and how to get connected, we have a great environment called Starting Point. This is a place where you get to ask questions about church, community, and what we believe and how you can get more connected here. So come on back behind the stage after the second and third service. We'll see you there.
good morning and welcome to Casas. It's so great to see you all here this morning. Everybody looking so Christmassy in their red and their cozy jackets. Great to see you all here this morning. If you are new with us here today, we're so glad that you uh, that you chose to be here today. Know that that's a big deal. It takes a lot to come to a to a new place, so we're so glad that you're here today. Um, if you are new, you'll notice in the in the seat back in front of you, there's a blue card that says "Welcome" on there. The first time says "First time guest." In the back says second time guest. If you could take and fill that out, um, first time, fill out the first time, second time, fill out the second time. We'd love to just get you a little bit more information about who we are and uh, ways that you can get plugged in here uh, into community at Casas. All right, we're going to continue right on with our worship. Uh, before we do that, why don't you uh, turn to the people around you and maybe share what your favorite uh, holiday or Christmas gift you ever gave was or ever got was. All right, go.
song to sing if you think about it the longing of that spirit lead me where my trust is without borders there's something profoundly impactful about that and I hope my prayer is that that's the longing within each of us that we wouldn't settle for for religion that we wouldn't settle for for something less than but ultimately that that our hearts and and who we are would long uh, to go somewhere deeper with God to live a life beyond ourselves it's amazing song it's wonderful to sing with you today I wanna invite the ushers to come forward right now as we uh, enter into a time of offering. And you know, a lot of times when, when the moment for, for offering kind of comes forward, we'll say something like, you know, thank you for partnering with us. And it occurs to me, and I, I had the privilege of talking with some people in the chapel last week and said the same thing. It occurs to me that I don't like that word partnering. And, and here's why. When we say that, it implies almost that there's like this strange partnership between you who, who sit here and then you know, us who are up here, the church kind of a deal as far as Casas. And so thank you for partnering with Casas. But here's the reality. Without you in this place, without you as this place, this is just a bunch of empty buildings and I'm a guy who just enjoys the sound of his own voice. It's true. You are the church. You are Casas, and I just want to thank you for, for being who you are and for displaying Christ in the way that you do. And so I don't want to ask you to partner with me and with us. What I ultimately want to say is, is keep being you. Keep sustaining all of the beautiful things that happen around here. Keep being a part of life change and putting on something every single week and throughout the week that ultimately declares that there is a good and beautiful God and that Jesus is real, especially at this time of the year at Christmas. And so allow me to pray over the offering as we begin to take it. To your heavenly Father, I come before you and thank you. God, I thank you for all that you have blessed us with. I thank you for Jesus, Lord. God, that you have, have given us uh, your son, Father, that we might know you, that you might enter into our sphere, our world, and bless us. We have everything that we need, God. And so I pray, Lord, that, that as we go to give of this moment, of our resources, of all that you've blessed us with, Father, that that you would leverage it. There are so many needs around us. There are so many people who long to know you. There are so many people who are journeying through life and and just struggling, God, and I pray that you would help us to meet those needs. Uh, Use this, Lord. Bless this time, God. Bless these resources with this offering that we all might be in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, A couple of things, uh, really, and it's all about Christmas. I don't know if you're aware of this. Maybe you missed it, but Christmas is about here. It's about time. If you've missed it, you are late on that game because it is everywhere. It's in every store. It's in everything. It's on every radio station. My house is now playing the 24-hour day Christmas music, which I treasure. I don't. Uh, But it's Christmas. And so, you know, what else is coming? The other thing that's coming around here is Christmas Eve here at Casas. We are going to be having our Christmas service. And I want to tell you about that. And here's why. Because when we, when we have a Christmas Eve service, it's so easy to invite people to something like that. I know that's the time where I'd want to invite my friends, neighbors, family type of thing. And, and part of what makes it easy to do that invite is simply by having an understanding of what's going to happen. So you don't have to worry about it, you know, so that you know what you're inviting people to. So allow me to tell you. Yes, we are going to have a Christmas Eve service. Yes, the times are at 3, 5, and 7. And here's kind of the crux of what we're wanting and hoping to convey and communicate with that service at large. And it's this, there are times within Christmas that, you know, it's a little complex. And here's what I mean. There's nostalgia, there's joy, there's family, there's relationships, all of these great moments, there's gifts. And yet there's also financial hardship and family awkwardness and all this stuff that kind of comes with it. Our, our whole notion of Christmas, if you really think about it, is surrounded by complexity. It's almost kind of messy in a weird way. And we want to be honest with that. And that's part of what we're looking at this year with Christmas is kind of taking this honest look. And so we're going to introduce you uh, in that service though, with the opener to a family called the Binkmans. And the Binkmans are an honest, good-hearted, well-to-do family. And yet, much like your family, much like mine, as you encounter them, you will see that there are cracks in the grand facade that is their perfectness. 
and, and it's a lot of fun and, and warm-heartedness. And I'd love to tell you more, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you watch a, a video where the Binkmans actually introduce themselves real quick. Is this thing on? How can you tell if it's recording? Merry Christmas, Cassis! Yeah, tilt the screen up. Tilt the screen up. Okay. Oh, like this. Okay. Uh, Merry Christmas, Cassis. Where's the Look camera? Into the camera. Dad, there, down here? Dad, it's the green, the green dot. What green? I don't see it's a green up, dot. It's up at the top. That tiny dot? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Merry Christmas, Cassis. Honey, honey, your face is a whole screen. Okay. Are we good? Okay. Uh, Merry Christmas, Cassis. We are the Binkmans. This is my wife, Annie, uh, my daughter, Haley, and my son, Nicholas. And I am Ted, and we are just so excited to be spending Christmas at Cassis 2013 with you guys. I mean, wow. I can't believe it. Somebody pinch me. This is so Ow! Nicholas, you don't need to pinch Dad. It's an expression. Uh, it's going to be a magical service. We're really excited about it. We're gonna open up with a family tradition of ours, some carols. Yes. Outside there's hot chocolate, uh, snow, mm -hmm. yeah, a photo booth. Oh man, a very large Christmas tree. Yes. Snow, uh -huh. uh, and even some real reindeer. No, no reindeer. No real reindeer. No. Oh, they should have real reindeer. Uh, it's gonna be an experience that's just not your everyday experience. It's going to be great. I even invited my entire family from Ohio. Why are we're that excited. Weird sweaters. I, mean, I like my sweater. Haley, just, you like everything. Them. That is so Guys, nice. the sweaters are not weird. They are festive because we are so excited about Christmas Eve yeah. at Cassis. Yeah. Merry <laughs> Guys. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Cassis from the Binkmans. Okay. How do you turn this off? Is it a touch screen? Dad. The light is still green. Is there a clicker? Is there a clicker somewhere? Do we just need to unplug it? Can Annie, can you unplug it? Dad. So that is the Binkman family uh, who is going to be uh, opening up Christmas Eve with uh, singing carols and just having a good time with that. And ultimately, as the night kind of moves forward with, at, you know, at Christmas Eve, you're going to see this, this idea of, you know, the honesty and complexity of Christmas, the beauty of it, because that's ultimately what's represented in that original Christmas story, too. I mean, think about this, by the way, for those of us that see the Christmas story with rosy-colored glasses, a pregnant woman riding a long distance on a donkey. I think that's enough said, right? Like, it's, it's complex. And so we're going to be moving forward with the honesty of the story, the honesty of kind of our own lives, and it also is going to culminate in this really kind of big celebration, this big moment with uh, Little Drummer Boy, where hopefully we all get to, to kind of enter into that and celebrate together. And here's what I'm going to tell you. There's a surprise on that night, and what I'm going to need from you all is for you to bring, if you own a smartphone, you don't have to, uh, you know, but if you do own a smartphone, don't just go out and buy one. If you own one, or you have an iPad with Wi-Fi where you can download apps, you know, that kind of deal with it. Um, bring that with you, and we're going we're gonna to have you participate with those things where, in fact, you will become a living, breathing part of the, the worship service itself and celebration. It's going to be amazing, and that's all going to be with this really energetic dance team that's going to be up here, too. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. So be excited. I hope it's a great, great service. In fact, I know it will be. I'm so excited. We put a ton of planning and energy into this, and I can't wait for you to see it. Last thing, outside in the courtyard, there is a 15-foot-tall Christmas tree uh, that has been out there for, I think, the last two weeks now. And today and next week, here's what I'd love from you all. For, for you as a family to go out, and there's a table out in front of it, and, and I'd love for you to grab one of the ornaments that is in kind of a bin that's out there. We'd like to provide that for you. And as one per family, as a family, if you'd write your last name on there and give that back, what we'd like to do is hang that ornament on that Christmas tree. I'd love for you to hang it, but the reality is, is we'd... We just have, you know, five foot of, of ornaments around a 15 foot tall Christmas tree and that'd just be weird. So we're going to hang them throughout this next week so that it, it's all over the place. Um, and, but ultimately, here's what's happening with that. It becomes a representation of all of us. That the sum is larger, you know, than its parts. That you are Casas. That we are Casas. So that when you look up there, you see yourself, but not only you, each and every person. And to take that a step further then, on Christmas Eve, we're going to open that same opportunity up for our guests to participate in the same way. And how beautiful is it? 
That, that if you're a new person, if you're a guest on that evening, that you can walk out and see all of us represented as this Casas Christmas tree and be invited to participate as if to declare that, that we already have a place for you, that we have thought of you, that we desire you to be here, and we're so excited. I think that's an amazing, amazing opportunity. So in the next, over the next two weeks, participate as a family, be a part of this. I'm so excited. I hope it's an amazing service. Uh, and so with all of us right now, as we begin this new series called Joy to the World, Glenn is going to come out and kind of kick us off, and I think it's going to be a great Sunday. Well, good morning. It's great to have you all here uh, on this wonderful Sunday, and we're in the Christmas season. Uh, hope you have your shopping done. <laughs> I don't have mine done, but uh, hope you have yours done. And uh, as I was uh, kind of pondering and thinking about this uh, series that we're starting off, it hit me that there are two really powerful songs that come together to capture the heart of the Christmas season, and one of them. Uh, is the song that we've kind of named this series after, and that's Joy to the World. And you think about Joy to the World, that the Lord has come, and let uh, heaven and nature sing, and just all that gets declared with that and the meaning of Christmas. And the other song that just dovetails into that, that, that just fills it all out, is Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, okay? <laughs> and if you put those two songs together, in some way you kind of have uh, what... The Christmas season seems to end up being all about in so many ways because we get to this part of the year and it always seems like we get run over by reindeer somehow. It's financial reindeer or relatives that are like reindeer or circumstances or something like that. Uh, Chandler and I went to a Walmart here this last week. We went in the evening and it was dark and so we pulled up and parked and as we're walking to the front door, you could just feel kind of the festive spirit uh, that it was because it was dark you could see all the lights and it was decorated and every time the doors would all open up you could hear the christmas music that they were playing on the inside come out and there was this sweet uh, man who was there working with the salvation army and he had the red kettle and the the bell and he was ringing it and it just it felt so Christmassy. And about that time, as we were walking up to that, a couple walked up from the side, and the guy seemed uh, just a little agitated. And there were some gals that were walking into the Walmart at the same time, and he looked at them, and, he, and this, I, this is exactly what he said. He goes, where's the Walmart? And you could tell, at first, these ladies were like, is this like a joke? Is this candid camera? Like, because this is all the, the, you know, the Walmart is like in front of us. Every building you see right now is the Walmart. And he said it again, where's the Walmart? And you could tell they were just like, uh, we're going to go in now. We don't know what to do with you. And he turned and he said this, where's the Walmart to a few other people. And no one really knew what to do. And for some reason, no one answered. We weren't quite close enough to answer at this moment. And so he walks up to the bell ringer who's there watching all of this. And he goes, Where's the Walmart? I want the Walmart. And the guy's just like, it's just through those doors, sir. That's the Walmart. And he goes, well, where's the sign for the Walmart? Why don't you have a sign for the Walmart? We need a sign for the Walmart. And this poor guy ringing the bell, you know, he's like, ding, 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 ding. I don't work for Walmart. I, I have nothing to do with the sign for Walmart. Why are you asking me these questions, you know? And, and apparently what had happened was this guy was new to the area and he, was, he came in off of Oracle. This is the uh, Oro Valley Marketplace of Walmart. So he comes in off of Oracle and there's the sign right there off of Oracle that says that uh, Walmart pulls in, only he pulls in and parks over between um, the Olive Garden and the Best Buy or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 
So he thinks that's where the Walmart is. He walked the whole length of all those stores, the Tillys and the Best Buy and the pet store, and there's no Walmart. From there, he walks all the way down to the movie theater, where there's just a few restaurants and a movie theater. And from there, he finally, you know, it must have felt like 10 miles of hiking. He shows up, and because he had walked parallel with Walmart, he never saw the sign. And he's just like, <laughs> and so he walked, and so we're all, everyone that kind of of was there for this moment, we're all kind of like, uh, no, no, uh, you know, Mr. Grumpy Pants, you go in first. <laughs> we don't want to be in front of you. And so he walks in, and just about the time he walks in, the doors open up, and they start a brand new Christmas song that just belts out. And he goes, the blinkety blink Christmas songs, I'm just sick of all this. I just want to get my shopping done. <laughs> It's just, you know, got run over by some reindeer is all I have. That's just what's going on. And so when you think of the Christmas season, right? In some ways, the Christmas season gets captured by joy to the world, those moments that are deep and reflective and thoughtful and raise our spirits. But, you know, this is the time of year when reindeer, you know, and our finances, our health, and, and with family relationships, all those things have a way of hitting us. It's this season of the year that uh, we love and bask in moments of maybe with friends or with our spouse, but this is also the time of the year that we're so reminded of where our families are broken or marriages that we failed at, and it feels like we were powerless to do something about it. It's a time of year when we gather our loved ones, but it's a time of the year that we remember those that we loved and lost and I'll never see on this side of heaven. It's a time of year where we love the festivities, we love the things, and we do so much work to put up lights and decorations and things, and then feel so exhausted. You know, how many people go into the Christmas season, you know, the day before Christmas, and they're just like, I'm just glad it's finally here because I'm just worn out. And it's a little bit of, you know, Grandma got run over by a reindeer with joy to the world. But I want you to remember this. This is important to remember. There is a difference between the Christmas season and the Christmas story. They're not the same thing. And the thing I would love for you to hang on to uh, throughout this morning as I walk through this message and we end the service, I want you to hang on to this notion that it is the Christmas story that empowers us to live with a joy that has come into this world that all of us can experience at some level. And of course, we understand that joy to be this notion that God came into this world. See, that's the Christmas story. The Christmas story is more than just God redeemed this world. It is how he went about it. You think of all the different ways God could have chosen to handle sin in this world. All of the different ways God could have said, you know, I can work through the technicalities of people who need to find forgiveness of their sin because they've been separated from God. All of that could have been worked out in a dozen different ways. God could have showed up as a man or a king and a day later uh, been crucified. Uh, God could have provided some other element of sacrifice or forgiveness or have done this in some other way, but he chose to do it the way he chose to do it. I love what uh, John says about this in some way. If you uh, have your Bibles and you want to follow along with me, in John chapter 1, he kind of sets up the Christmas story. We don't think of it as the Christmas story, but he kind of does here. And John, in his gospel, of course, begins by referring to Christ as the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and he's referring to Christ. In the beginning was Christ. And then down in uh, verse 14, he says this, um, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Think about that for a moment. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And what John is saying in that moment is, I knew him, I talked with him, I put my arm around him, 
I watched him work with people. We saw his glory and his beauty, not because it was far up in heaven. It's because he came, he was born into this world as a human being, as a baby who had to grow up and understand pain and suffering and difficulties. He had to understand difficult family relationships. He had to understand difficult finances. All the things that we know and have to experience in this world as a part of our human condition, Jesus came and was in the middle of that. And the beauty, I think, of that in so many ways, of course, that is a part of the, uh, of the Christmas story, is what that meant. It not only meant that he understands us in some way that helps us connect with him, it means he wanted to come into our lives to make a difference and touch us in some way prior to us getting to heaven. I mean, think about this for a moment. God could have said, you know what? I really, I, I love you, I care about you, I'm gonna provide a way of salvation for you, but we're not gonna have much interaction until you're whole and healthy and sanctified and pure. And when all that's taken care of, you come up to heaven and then, then we'll, then then we'll have a great time together, right? But he didn't. There's something about Jesus who said, I want to get in and know and be a part of and empower and infuse joy and goodness in the lives of people right now where they are in this world. That is the story of Christmas, a God who comes into our world. That is why we sing joy to the world. And you think about this. You know, I think, I think about uh, the Gospels, and uh, there's, in particular, there's a guy who has this shriveled hand. He's been handicapped from this. And this guy, uh, because of this, he is seen as having a, some sort of spiritual curse that God has this disdain for him. Uh, he couldn't earn a living. When we pick up the story, and we'll do that here in a moment, we see that he is in the synagogue, and that's probably because that is a place he could go to find pity from other people that would help provide for his food that day or shelter. Because something, was, it, it, the injury was severe enough or the birth defect he was born with was severe enough, he couldn't even hold down a job. And see, for him, he was powerless in some way. And Jesus is going to come into his life, and we'll see this in a morning, in a moment, and change it because that's what the Christmas story is about. But I want you to think about this for a moment. Where is it that you find yourself in this world struggling with being powerless to overcome something that matters deeply to you. Because I think that's part of what we all face. And I think part of the Christmas season causes us to feel and reflect on some of those aspects, maybe deeper this time of year than any other time of year. Somewhere in your life, there's something that hurts, something that scares you, something that creates anger, makes you want to run. And if you had the power to change it, you would. But as a finite creature in a broken world, we often find ourselves powerless to do something about it. And that was this man. This man has a severe handicap and, it is, and he is powerless to overcome what he wants to overcome most. And I want you to consider for a moment when we think about this this particular man, and we're going to look at his story some more here in a moment. Consider this. What would have happened if the Christmas story had never happened? What if God would have picked one of those other ways to deal with uh, providing salvation or redemption to the world, but Jesus would have never come in this world, and Jesus would have never interacted in this world, never would have engaged with human beings? What if the Christmas story never happened? What would that have meant for just this one guy? It would have meant a lot. It meant, it would have meant that he probably would have never even had the opportunity to be married. You realize being handicapped in this way, unable to hold down a job, this man, he'd never be married because there's no family that would have given their daughter in marriage to a guy that couldn't support him or support their kids. Worse than that, do you understand that in this culture, people would have looked at this man and they would have seen this as a curse from God on him. God's disdain that somehow either he sinned in the womb, which was uh, one of their common beliefs in that time when someone was handicapped in this way, that somehow they, they sinned before they were even born. Or worse, it was a curse that was being passed down from their grandparents or their parents. They did something that so displeasured God that God actually created this curse that was passed down from generations 
generation to generation. And so because of that, what parents would ever say, we'll give our daughter to that guy so that our grandchildren can live under that curse? No way. No, he would have lived in a village where no one would have ever ever considered giving their daughter to him in marriage. He would have never had a moment where he could have earned a living for himself. This is a man that would live the rest of his life and he would never know the encouragement or the partnership or the intimacy of a mate. This is a man that would have never had the possibility of feeling his daughter put his, her arms around her neck, or a son that might look him in the eye and say, I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. This is a man that would never get to feel the satisfaction of a long, hard day's work because he carried the shame of a curse and a handicap that he was powerless to overcome. That would have been his life. You can just picture this man living his life, having the life squeezed out of his soul, like a tin can being drugged to the fathoms, the deepest fathoms of a sea where the weight of the entire ocean crushes it. And the weight of the ocean that this man carried was one of shame. And maybe some of you here this morning, you say, I know what it's like to have that kind of crushing shame or guilt or sense of failure. But here's the good news, right? Christmas did happen. Christmas did happen. God did come and Jesus walked this planet. And there came a day where Jesus said, I'm going to walk into that guy's village. And my heart and my desire is I'm going to have an encounter with this guy. And his day as he walks into this village, it starts with this conversation that he has with the religious leaders. And of course, anytime Jesus as kind of a traveling rabbi would come into any village, uh, there would be religious leaders that would come and have all these theological discussions and talk about this stuff. And the one they had on this day, which plays into this story, very, uh, this very important part of the story, is that they begin talking about the meaning of the Sabbath. And Jesus gets a little frustrated with them over all the rules and the regulations and everything that they want the Sabbath to become. And Jesus makes this statement, and this becomes important later in the story. He says, guys, you're missing something here. When you see me doing the things that I do on the Sabbath, you have to understand, I'm doing this because I know what the Sabbath is really all about. In fact, and he makes this statement that would have just sent them over the deep end. He says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. That is a pretty bold statement to make. And he says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. And you just picture the religious leaders, you know, just, you know, just, you know, they don't know what to do with this. And so from there, and this is where I want to pick up the story. If you would flip with me over to uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, is where I'm going to pick up the story. He has this conversation with the religious leaders. And now Jesus very deliberately is going to change the whole tenor of the story and how it's going to play out because he's got something he wants to do. And it involves this man that is carrying the curse of the shame of an entire community that is looking down on him as something less than valuable to God or to people. And here's where we pick it up, verse uh, 9. It says this, going from that place where they're having this uh, discussion about uh, who's Lord of the Sabbath. Going from that place, he went into their synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And you can just picture this man and he's seeing the entourage of all of these religious leaders and here's Jesus and you just see this guy going, oh, I hate it when this happens because they're going to come in here and they're going to talk about spiritual things and every time it gets on a theological conversation and I'm around, they always want to use me as the object lesson and that never works good for me, right? And sure enough, that is exactly where the religious leaders uh, want to go with this. Look at the rest of the verse. It says, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And of course, this guy's standing here, and this is, uh, well, we got, you know, this guy here. Well, let's ask, now we got him, because we know Jesus likes to help people like this, and he cares about them, but he just claimed that he's Lord of the Sabbath, and we're going to put him to the test here, because of course, if you're Lord of the Sabbath, you know that to heal a guy like this, that is technically considered work, and to work on the Sabbath is to break the Sabbath law. So are you going to still claim to be Lord of the Sabbath, and yet break the Sabbath law? That's kind of the angle of what they're trying to do with this. And Jesus, as only Jesus can, begins to flip this upside down on its head and make it into something so 
beautiful. And so here's, uh, here's what uh, Jesus does. And he's going to heal this man, but he's got a few questions of his own uh, that's going to change the circle circumstances before he does this. Look at verse 11. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? And I love what he does in this moment. It's just like, okay, guys, you know, I know you guys have sheep and you know, probably in this village, there'd be a lot of sheep herders here and even some of these religious leaders. And he's saying, if you know, if you had a sheep, you understand the value of that sheep. And I know some, and you know, it's like he can read his, their mind. He knows what they would do. And he's just saying, you know, if you had a sheep, and it is valuable to you. And it would have been, you know, in a remote village like this, the wool that they would have gotten from that sheep to uh, slaughter that sheep at different times, of, you know, at different times of the year, the meat that it would probably, that would be so critical to their economics. And what he's saying is that sheep, if it fell into a pit on the Sabbath, you'd find a way to find some loophole to get that sheep out of that pit. And you know why? Because that sheep is valuable to you. You in no way would spend an entire Sabbath day listening to the cries and the bleeding of that sheep at the bottom of that pit, hurt or struggling or fearful in the darkness of that. You would get that sheep out of the pit because it's just that valuable to you. And then he says this. And you got to picture this man standing there. Verse 12. How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? And in that moment, right, he's looking at this guy and he's saying, you, just the questions you've asked, you have missed how God sees the value of a human being. You have missed in all of your studies of Yahweh, in all of your devotion to be righteous, in all of your work to obey him in the littlest, in the smallest of the ways, in all of your work to know Yahweh, to be someone that would be seen righteous in all of this stuff, in all of that stuff about that God, you have missed fundamentally how that God feels about this man that has been a part of your community. You talk with him. You know him. You know his family, and yet you have missed how God feels about him. See, and Jesus, right, he's going to play this back in to this whole notion of the Sabbath. And here you are, and you dare to ask a question about whether or not I would heal this guy on the Sabbath. Well, let me tell you something. I am Lord of the Sabbath. And let's talk about that for a moment. And here's what he says in the next uh, breath. He says, therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Right? And you understand what he's doing in this moment? And he says, it is good. You understand how valuable a human being is? I'm here to tell you, as the Lord of the Sabbath, we do good on the Sabbath. If there is any day of the week, if there is any day of the week, it is the Sabbath, the day that we stop and rest and reflect on the beauty of God, on the day that we set aside to honor all that we know and understand and all that this God stands for, on the day that we think of as being holy, what better day of the week than to pull little sheep out of pits? What better day of the week? And you see him standing in front of the sky. What other day would God not love to see this man healed? On his day, right? See, he takes their notion, and it's no longer, what can you get away with on the Sabbath? Jesus is saying, the Sabbath is a day to know God would declare that God would love this man to be healed on this day. Because this man is more valuable than one of those little sheep that matter to you, that you'd make sure gets out of that pit. Do you see what Jesus is doing? And with those words, and you can read this on your own in verse 13, following those words, Jesus says this. He turns to that man and he says, stretch out your hand. And with those words, Jesus not only heals this man physically, Jesus restores his value as a human because when that man stretches out his hand and it is whole and, he, uh, and healed and healthy, in that moment, it is like Jesus is saying, there is no curse over this man. You have entirely missed how God feels about this man. That's the Christmas story. 
a God who didn't just sit up in heaven. A God who came down and said, this man is powerless to heal his own body and he is powerless to lift the shame on his shoulders off of him and live as the person I want him to be. But Jesus said, I have the power. And the Christmas story is a story of a God who came down here to exercise his power in just that way. See, that's the beauty of the Christmas story. You just picture this man walking out of that synagogue. Can you imagine that? This guy walks out of that synagogue, and the thing that was crushing his soul, the weight of that shame, it is gone. That man walks out of that synagogue, and he has life by the tail. He has things opened up to him that he never saw as being possible. He's probably going to walk out that door and say, I got to decide what kind of job I want now. I'm going to start looking for, you know, girls around the town now. I'm, I'm going to start a dating life now. I'm going to, life is, you know, and it started because God empowered him in ways he couldn't himself. So I want you to think about the Christmas story. It is the story of a God who up in his heaven said, right, I'm going to come all the way down here to earth because I want to interact and I want to rub shoulders and I want to get to know my creation and I want them to know me and where they are powerless, I want to give them power that they might experience the joy that I have brought from heaven into this world. See? So here's the question I have for you, because I want to follow up with a couple of challenges. Here's my question. Where, where in your life do you feel powerless, right? Where is that moment? Because to be human is to have powerless moments. Where in your life do you, that maybe it's with your kids and you see your kids hurting or suffering or making decisions and you, and just, you know, and they're old enough now and you just, and you feel powerless to help them get to that good spot. Maybe it's a marriage where you just say, I just, I want my marriage to work. But man, the frustration and the hurt, it turns me inside out. Maybe it's your job that is stressing you out and you know what you wish could change. It's just, you don't have the power to change it. And maybe it's your body, right? Our bodies have a way of not cooperating. Or maybe it's illness, and maybe it's serious. I want to challenge you on two things with the application here, okay? I want you to think about where you feel powerless. And the first thing that I want to challenge you on is this. Seek God's joy in your world, okay? Seek it out. And here's what I mean by this. You know, we sing the song, Joy to the World, and we think about all that that means. God comes in the world, joy to the whole world. That world is your world. When we sing joy to the world, you count in that. You're a part of that. You're, when God sent his son to this world, he had you in mind. It's okay for you to say and to seek God, I want your joy in my life in some way. Um, you know, when Jesus makes that powerful statement to those religious leaders and he says, how much more valuable is a person? That's your statement. That could be said in all truth about you. When Jesus said that, you were not excluded from that, friends. When Jesus makes that point that human beings are more valuable than little lambs that have fallen in pits, that's your statement. And maybe there's a moment as you struggle that you need to embody that. Maybe you need to make that a state. Maybe you need to say, when Jesus said those words and say them, you know, say them to yourself. You, you may not want to say them out loud like when you're on an elevator or a bus or something like that, that you know, people think you're nuts. But maybe you need to embrace that statement and say, when Jesus said that, he said that for me too. I am more valuable. And that's you. And you need to know that. Um, and it is okay for you to pray for God's strength 
and empowerment where you don't have strength. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want you to think about that area that scares you or that you feel powerless and pray for God to do something in that. If it's something physical, pray for that. It's okay to say, God, would you heal my body? Would you improve my health? It's okay for you to say, God, I've got circumstances at work and it just creates misery and agony and depression every time I go into the office or go to work. Please, God, could you change the circumstances of my life in a supernatural way. Could you do that for me? I promise you it is okay for you to ask. God doesn't mind you asking. And sometimes, and the reason I say this is sometimes we carry a kind of guilt and shame. Sometimes we look at that and we just say, yeah, I shouldn't really be asking for that because, you know, there's this thing in my past. There's that stupid sin that I did. There's that thi There's this thing about me. And if anybody knew the truth of my sin or my heart, then they would, you know, and I'd, so I, it's not okay for me. No, God knows all of that. You just, just... God would delight in you in asking, which follows this. Here's the other thing. Uh, I want you to look for where God is changing things in your life, where God answers that prayer, where God empowers your life. And know this, he might answer it in the physicality. There might be something where some of you, and I know some of you have experienced this, where God may actually heal your body or someone in your family, and that will be an amazing thing and you celebrate that and you hang on to that. You might find that God's going to change the circumstances of work or change the circumstances at school. You know, that's the other kicker of the Christmas season. It lands like right in finals week, right? And I'm sure all of you are just saying, oh man, you know, I've got that professor and I just, and pray for a change and maybe God will give you one. But now let me say this, understand that God doesn't always answer our prayers in the physicality of things. Remember Paul? Paul has a moment where he describes it as being a thorn, right? This awful thing that plagued him. He begged God to change it. Remember what he says about it? God didn't change it because God didn't want to. Because there was something different and greater that God wanted to do in Paul's life. The miracle of what Paul prayed for didn't happen in the physicality of his life. It happened inside of him. And I, and I mean this. Sometimes when you pray for those things where you're powerless, look for how God is giving you power and answering that prayer inside of you. Look for how God is changing you. You might find that he doesn't change your circumstances at work, but what if he empowers you in such a way that you are now quite capable of handling what you could not handle before? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Is that not joy coming into your world that you have become greater and stronger? Embrace it. Celebrate it. Okay, here's my second challenge. Second challenge to all of us, okay? And it's this. Express God's joy to the world. As you find those places where you were powerless and God empowers you to experience God's joy in your heart and in your life, this amazing thing happens. It sets all of us up now, and you see this all throughout the New Testament, this idea that as God has blessed us, we get to be an expression of that in the world. As God has empowered you where you were powerless, consider this. Is there a powerless person in your life right now? Is there someone that you know that is dying under guilt or anguish or circumstances in life and it is crushing their soul and you have the power to do something about it. Do something about it. Maybe God's put that person in your life. You get, see, this is the beauty of it. There is a kind of joy we experience when we express God's joy into this world. You get to be the person who's pulling that other person out of that pit. You get to pull some little lambs out of some pits. You get to be the one that does good in the name of God. I love it when Jesus says, you know the Sabbath? You know what's lawful on the Sabbath? To just do good. You can do good. Do good in somebody's life. What better season than the Christmas season to do good in somebody's life for no apparent reason? In fact, I'll challenge you to do this. And, and the reason I say this is because uh, very authentically, this is a challenge God's given me, okay? 
do good in somebody's life who can't return the favor. Do that. Um, this past week, uh, God really laid something on my heart, nudged me, and you know, and I, and I don't say that lightly, and, I, and please understand, I don't get up every morning and God gives me instructions for the day and what to do, I just, that's, okay? It happens in my life that there are moments where I believe God is nudging me or saying something to me. And this happened to be one of those occasions. And it was about doing something very specific for someone to just do good in their life. And this person has no ability to return this favor in any way, shape, or form. And I kind of blew it off at first and just like, you know, it's just a nice thought. And all of a sudden I came back and just like, no, I think God's actually saying, Glenn, I would love for you to be an expression of me in that person's life in this very precise way. And I get to do that and realize there's a kind of deep joy for me in getting to be God's joy for another person. Be that. And you don't have to wait for God to tell you to do that, to do that. You're like perfectly allowed to just like go out and do that on your own. Because there is no season, right, that's better than this season to do that. Now, third thing with this, third uh, thing, I'm going to close with this. Uh, in expressing joy to the world here. And it is this, declare your joy that you know in song and in unity. And I'm gonna actually have us do this all together in these next few uh, moments here. But there's something really special as a community comes together and can declare something in unity. When we worship, do you understand the declaration and the unity and the meaning? We're hearing other voices reinforce this thing that we believe in or putting forth. And we get to do this before God and before others. And there's something intrinsically good about doing that. Now, and I'm gonna make this request, and I'm really serious about this. Now, uh, and first of all, you know what? I know there's probably a number of you here this morning, and you're not a follower of Christ, and you're saying, I'm kinda of here checking this out. You know what? You do whatever you want this morning. I'm just like, we're thrilled. You're just here taking it in. If you wanna sing, you sing. If you wanna sit back and listen, you sit back and listen. You do anything you want. You're our guest, glad you're here. But let me put this challenge out to every one of you who are Christ followers here, and I really mean this. Most of the time, we say, if you're a Christ follower and you want to sing the worship song, you sing it. If you don't want to sing, don't sing. If you want to sit, sit. You just do whatever you want. You, make, you just be a part of this as you want. But can I make the request that on this next song, if you are a Christ follower, that you do sing. Don't let your voice go silent. Make this a moment of 100% unity in this room of Christ followers expressing and declaring that joy has indeed come into this world. And it is not just any joy. It is a joy that we sing about and we feel and we know it because it is a joy that is not just theoretical or a joy that is waiting for us up in heaven. It is a joy that is coming into this world and it is a joy that has changed your life. And it is a joy that has changed my life. It is a joy that empowers us where we are powerless. It is a joy that has lifted the curse of shame and guilt off of you. Every one of you that is a follower of Christ, you do not have to carry shame and guilt with you. So you sing and declare this song. So I want us to stand here, okay? This is our chance. I want you to sing this song, Joy to the World, and use your outdoor voice, okay? Use your voice that declares this. Sing it like it makes you happy. Sing it like it matters that people outside these walls would feel it. Sing it like it comes from someone who has been healed on the inside and the outside. Sing it like that man would have sung it the first time he left the synagogue whole and healthy. You declare it.
to be thankful for. I want to thank you for being here today. If you're new with us here today, we would love to meet you right after the service here in the Connection, uh, connection Room. Uh, come on back. We'd love to say hi. Everybody else, have a great week. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. Merry Christmas.